Wonderful. So I'm uh, Caroline Newton. I am uh, from the TU Delft, but also uh, from the KU Leuven in Belgium. Uh, and I would like to welcome everyone again to our workshop on the call for a manifesto for the just city. And we are extremely glad to have you here today and happy that many of you have decided to, to participate in this call. Because we are living in extraordinary times, we have climate change, pandemic, conflict and suffering, often leading to migration, growing in inequality and the erosion of democracy. So our world is facing several successive shocks. But to achieve a better world, we must be able to imagine it. And, and to imagine this better, better world, we need to articulate our ideas so others can partake in our imagination. So we need new and better collective visions for cities and communities that are just inclusive and sustainable. And when I say uh, we, we, then it's a, a team of uh, TU Delft Global Urban Lab, which is the TU Delft platform to discuss issues of urbanization in the global south. And we are also supported by the Delft Global Initiative and the Spatial Justice Network. And uh, Hugo will put the links to these organizations in the chat. Um, this event is organized in partnership with several schools, uh, the Institute for Housing and Urban Development Studies, where I work, uh, represented by myself, Carolina Luneta, uh, the University of Illinois with Professor Fananak Miraftab, the Winslow Selling State University in North Carolina with Professor Russell Smith, and a number of universities who took, who took up this exercise as a class exercise. Um, also, um, notably uh, University, uh, Morgan University with Professor Christina Murphy, KU Leuven uh, in Belgium, the Cape Peninsula University of Technology in South Africa and many others. Two weeks ago, um, Professor Faranak Miraftab talked to us about the need to decolonize our minds and seek for the just city that is life giving rather than profit making. Last week, um, we had um, Professor Mona Fawas from the University, American University in Beirut, who told us about urban informality as an insurgent practice and reflected on the role of the state, leading us to important questions of rights and inclusion. Today, we have a very special guest, uh, Professor Mariana uh, Fix from the Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism uh, of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Uh, Mariana will talk to us about the commodification and financialization of the city. Um, she's the author of the books Partners in Exclusion and Sao Paulo Global City, both published in Brazil by Boitempo uh, Editorial. Uh, Mariana holds a PhD in economics from the, from the University of Campinas, a master's and a bachelor's degree uh, from the um, University of Sao Paulo. Uh, furthermore, Mariana Fix is a member of the Housing and Human Settlements Laboratory at FAUSP, and she has been working with Rights to the City organizations for several years. Um, well, so the overall idea of this event is that by organizing and participating in such activities, we extend the motor learning uh, much beyond the classroom. Um, so before we hear from Professor Mariana Fix, I would like to give the word to Roberto Rocco. We can't hear you, Roberto. I was talking like for five minutes already. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to see you here. If you want to say hello on the chat and say where you are from, you are very welcome. I see that there are almost 160 people in the room right now. And I just wanted to uh, really welcome uh, warmly um, to welcome Mariana. Uh, I think she will tell you, but uh, I went to school with her. Uh, we went to university together. So it's a really a great pleasure to have her here. She is one of the great names in financialization and understanding the neoliberal city. Before we uh, hear from her, I'd like to remind you that um, we have two lists. We have the list of the participants of this, uh, of this uh, workshop, and we have the list of the groups. So please, if you haven't registered your group yet, please do so. I see that there are more than 70 groups already registered. 
some of them are still missing uh, information, please um, put all, all information there because if you are uh, uh, submitting a if you are submitting a manifesto, we need to know all the correct information so we can can we can give you a certificate. Um, okay, it's we apologize for the for the uh, messed up um, uh, conversations uh, we had last week because of the uh, we couldn't set up the breakout rooms. And that is because uh, Zoom has a limitation. It doesn't let you uh, form breakout rooms when there are more than 200 people in the room. Um, it, it lets you uh, form breakout rooms that are very big with 10 people. So today we are going to test something new. We are going to, uh, to, uh, to do a, a kind of online survey, participatory survey with everyone using Mentimeter, but that's for later. Um, all right, this is our second manifesto for the Just City Workshop. The first manifesto was organized in November 2020 and gathered participants from 102 universities from all over the world who delivered 43 manifestos. So to, for now, we are uh, seeing that we have more universities actually uh, joining us and there are more than 70 groups. So we hope that we will uh, really break uh, uh, break the record and have lots of, of really wonderful manifestos that will be uh, published in a book. Um, without further ado, I'd like, uh, well, um, just to give you, uh, uh, Ugo is putting the, the link to the book that was published last year in the chat. But without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our speaker, Mariana, uh, Professor Mariana Fix. Thank you, Mariana, for being here. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hoko. Thank you so much, Hoko and all the organizers. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's also a great responsibility to speak at such a well-organized and relevant event uh, with engaged and informed audience. Uh, I was told that there are people from uh, over 100 different universities and also to be preceded by Professor Faranak and Mona. And uh, I will share with you a presentation I prepared for today. Um, so, I guess you can see it. Not yet. Yes? Uh, it's uh, still coming up, I think. Yeah, I think it's still on the way. I'm watching it also from the phone to make sure that I, I know what's showing for you. And I see it's not started yet. I don't know. I think perhaps it's because we have more people now, because when we tried, it was working. But I think it will work in, in a while, just a minute. Mm -hmm. mm. Let's try it again. Just a second. Can you try again? Um, I'm trying, but I will stop and try again. My feeling is that when the room is very full, things start to not work very well. <laughs> yes, perhaps that's it. Uh, but I think it you managed. Yeah, it, it shows that I started uh, sharing the screen, but you can see it. Can you send it to me? Maybe I can. Yeah, sure. 
Ouais. You can send it to me and uh, you, you can start. Uh, I will take care of the presentation, don't worry. Okay. If it doesn't work, uh, we, we do it the same way. Uh, can I send it in the WhatsApp? Uh, no, in the uh, email, please. Email. Okay. Oh, I see that you, uh, it doesn't work, Mari, in the, you have to give me access. So can you send me the presentation itself? Uh, I, I will give it to, I give access to you, don't worry. Sorry, everyone, we, we, uh, we, we tested it and it worked and now it's not working. We think it's because the room is very full. Yeah. We don't know. No, it's, it's the only reason because it was working. I, I, uh, now you have the permission to open it. Okay. Yes, cool. I will um, share the screen. You can, you can start, start talking. Okay. Mike. Okay. Th so thank you so much again. I'm sorry about that. It would be much better to be with the in person with you. We wouldn't have this kind of problems. And I could meet uh, my friend Hoko and, and to meet all of the organizers at least. So it's, as I was saying, I will talk today about uh, the capitalist city and the production of urban space under neoliberalism and financialization or finance-led globalization from a point of view of uh, constituted in the global south, south with a historiographical approach. For this, uh, I'm going to make uh, use of an article which uh, was made available to you. Uh, it's a, an article I wrote uh, with Pedro Arantes. It's the next, uh, please, Hoko. And it was written at, at the suggestion of uh, the journal editors, Vanessa Watson and Ronan Petson, uh, who critically dialogued with us for, throughout the writing process with academic rigor and uh, much generosity. My remarks are also based, um, I think I, uh, it's, it's the last one, Hope I think I will, I'll ask you to move, uh, no, yeah, just one. Uh, my remarks are also based on research I've carried out on the theme of housing, urban entrepreneurship, planning models, real estate, finance capital, and financialization, gentrification, and PPPs over the three uh, of the last three decades. In doing so, I hope to contribute to the debate on commodification and financialization, as suggested by the organizers, by discussing how recent changes. Uh, that I've been trying to map through those research affect capitalist uh, urbanization. Examined in its planetary dimension and uh, in longer term, uh, capitalist urbanization has always expanded in a violent and even and predatory way. And next, therefore, expanding Therefore, expanding visibility of Southern uh, theories and practices is not only a means of defending epistemological diversity, but above all, contributing to the broad critical field since events and ideas in the South are powerful for understanding the world as a whole, and not only the South, as per uh, Alan Mabam. Thus, I begin by briefly revisiting a set of hypotheses produced uh, by some uh, generations of authors in the field of urban studies in Brazil. Uh, the former one. Uh, apparently, I, I, I have some text on the, it's the former one. 
in the slides just to make it uh, easier um, due to the languages. So it's it's the, the number six now, Hoku, please. Thanks, that's it. Apparently chaotic uh, Latin American cities landscapes and their history reveal uh, how capitalism unfolds and develops in our continent. This apparent chaos has, although, uh, has a rationality behind it, behind this superficial chaos lies a systematic uh, or a systemic inequity in the distribution of benefits of urbanization and of the social reproduction of labor. These disparities are not merely a reflection of social inequalities, but are accentuated by spatial segregation, social controls, and strategies aimed at the depreciation of real estate values. The effort to dissect the forms of production of built environment is important for any project of social transformation, especially in the context of planetary urbanization. Uh, the next slide, please. Brazilian intellectuals and scholars have formulated original theories to explain the country's urbanization process relating urban issues to more general problems of an evil development in a post-colonial and imperialist concept. The next. At the same time, urban social struggles produce relevant practice of social resistance and mobilization, which oppose uh, hegemonic uh, urban uh, planning projects guided by entrepreneurship and the commodification of the city. The historiographical approach favors the understanding on how neoliberalism and financialization act a reality very different from that of the United States or Europe, for instance, generating different consequences. It's important to understand that in countries of the global North, housing and cities have played a very important role in the process of globalization and financialization of the economy. And uh, they were not a mere reflection of the army. They were a very active and important part of it, intrinsic to the process of financialization. And something similar happened here in, uh, in Brazil and in, in some countries of Latin America. But however, it should also be noted that this process affect, affect a dependent uh, economy, a former colony such as ours in a different way. So Brazil has produced a relevant and original field of urban studies inserted in the tradition, in tradition of critical thinking that problematizes the dependency relationship in global capitalism. And I, get, I believe that that's important to understand what's going on nowadays. This field of studies reveals aspects of capitalist uh, expansion not always perceived and theorized in the so-called developed countries. The Brazilian university system started approaching urban studies in a more organized and systematic way during the 60s in order to understand the relationship between wealth and power, modernity and backwardness, migration and employment, inclusion, inclusion and marginalization, formality and informality, private property and clandestine access to land, for instance. The challenge was to understand the clash between hyperurbanization and underdevelopment. As a result, this contradictory and complex urbanization requires new categories and hypotheses to be formulated to understand the unequal and extreme processes that are intrinsic to the violent expansion of capitalist social relations across the globe. The very intensity of Brazilian urbanization accelerated and uneven, surrounded by conflicts and paradox, propelled the field of urban studies and gave the topic a sense of, of urgency. The overwhelming process of internal migrations, urban growth, and the production of new cities, including the new modernist capital, Brasilia, was responsible for shaking up the university, drawing its attention to the topic in the 60s. As a result, this, um, the, this overwhelming process of internal migrations, urban growth, and the production of, uh, sorry, as a result, this, during these new decades, urban studies became one of the most promises, uh, promising and interdisciplinary strains on the, in the economy. In this slide, you can see this turning point from rural to urban and the, the speed of the Brazilian um, urbanization, which is part of the explanation uh, to this uh, development of, uh, of a field of studies that I'm trying to, to tell you more about it. 
um, that was not specialized in the beginning in, in uh, urban sturges. It was not even called urban sturges, it, but it uh, put together people from uh, intellectuals and scholars from different backgrounds, all of them uh, facing the same challenge to understand what was going on in, with this urbanization process, in which ways it was similar to those in other countries, but also the specificities, the specificities of what they called the social Brazilian social formation. And later it specialized in a, in a field, the academic field with uh, its own uh, postgraduate studies and universities and so on. But so, so we call uh, that the Brazilian uh, matrix of urban studies, a matrix, a matri a matrix of um, thought on land, labor, capital, and power. Uh, this academic uh, production is important to say is paired with new practices and forms of social mobilization and resistance that emerged uh, from this turbulent con context as well. At this time, uh, we were uh, living in a dictatorship in Brazil, and, uh, and so it was from the beginning connected with uh, grassroots uh, movements that many hypotheses were formulated and uh, dealing with the challenges of social struggle posed by social movements. So the question was how to explain uh, this uh, intense uh, mig migra migratory process of urban growth without the corresponding modernization of productive forces that had accompanied the phenomenon in countries at the center of global capitalism. In Sao Paulo, for instance, the main center of uh, Brazilian industrialization, these issues were present, given a spa spatial evidence of these gaps that could be seen in the cityscape itself. The production of wealth took place side by side with the growth of poverty. It was a time that uh, Brazil was like one of the countries that was the, have, leading uh, very uh, fast uh, process of economic growth, but at the same time, there was a lot of poverty. How to explain, how to understand that? And there, was, there were some uh, hypotheses. I will just summarize two of them, which you can see on the screen. One of them is called urban uh, spoliation, and the other one, the selective application of urban law. Urban spoliation, the term is uh, urban spoliation, characterized forms of dispossession of the lower classes resulting from the combination of economic growth and urban institution, which is intrinsic to the process of urbanization in the periphery of capitalism. In Lucius Kovaric's definition, urban spoliation is the sum of extortions that operate through the absence or precariousness of urban amenities and services that is presented as socially necessary in relation to prevailing Substance, uh, subsistence levels, and which further aggravate the relationships of production and exploitation of labor. The urban setting, in the sense, is the denial of the production of the labor force at acceptable levels. The other one, the selective application of urban law, uh, means that in the urbanization process, the legal city, the so-called legal city, highly, highly regulated, the formal city, if you want to call it like that, uh, become um, uh, an exception in Brazil in the face of the immense urbanization results resulting from citizens' direct actions outside official planning laws, such as slums and favelas and, uh, and tenements. Once the norm has been swallowed uh, by the exception, the role of effort of normative rationality and the crux of ideas of modern urban studies become questionable. However, systematic law breaking, it's important to, to mention, is the rule both for the legal and the legal city from the ruling class and the poor. The urban stages changed uh, its political standing starting in the aging, thanking to its progressive connection between theory and practice, research and public policies, and teaching and political activism. The intense circulation occurs in other countries of South, uh, of Global South, as well as acknowledged by Alan Maban in, the, in his essay, Theory from the Southern City. 
It's also an agenda for action built in, in a long tradition of engaged scholarship. As a result, Brazil gradually became a major urban policy laboratory and a place for innovative theory as well, including uh, the next uh, slide, please, including participatory budget, budgeting, investment in peripheries, urban qualification and facilities, land regularization, participation, participatory slum upgrading, Particip uh, housing design, technical support to mutual ed, housing production by social movements, and, and so on. Controversies related to globalization and neoliberalism uh, made, uh, uh, made this, the, the, this fuel of urban studies make a shift and deals with changes in Brazilian economy and society. The progressive agenda of urban reform, with those elements I just mentioned, has come under increasing pressure from groups that seek to expand and reshape cities according to their own interests. Property developers, in the manner of so activists or more like lobbyists, push for change in the urban planning and housing policy. The opening of new grand boulevards, the increase in verticalization indices, the introduction of housing subsidies, in addition, there were changes in the regulatory framework, such as the creation of the Brazilian real estate finance system in the end of the 90s, including the creation of certificates of real estate receivables that resemble the US mortgage-backed securities. Some, some other key contemporary debates are global mega events, public-private partnerships, inner city gentrification, housing and city financialization, rising forms of urban warfare, and social control in favelas and number insurgencies. In the, in the article I sent to you, we go into each one of these debates. We try to offer a map of the current uh, debates and also try to understand what are the new approaches towards it, what are their dialogues with other countries, with the global north, and try to see if we have again uh, new um, and original theories similar to what happened in the 60s. And what we notice that uh, nowadays it's sometimes uh, also taking benefit of the possibilities of the internet. It's easier for students and even for researchers, for professors, for um, scholars to read uh, the new book uh, from, uh, from very relevant and important authors from the global north. But, uh, but part of this uh, own way of thinking, the organization which was formed uh, in the 60s and 70s, it's not so easy to take into account. That's why we tried in this article to offer uh, this uh, hypothesis that we had like there uh, a matrix of uh, urban, uh, thinking that perhaps can be useful to not just to think uh, the reality of the urban South, but to rethink uh, urban theory, of course, in dialogue uh, with different uh, traditions, different way of thinking. So it's with this uh, hypothesis that uh, I go back to my own research on uh, PPPs and on uh, financialization that I've been doing for a while. This one on the screen is, uh, I think we were two colleagues, Hoko. Uh, it was from my, from my first uh, research at uh, the architecture school, which was a, a kind of urban, what we called, it's the way that PVP is uh, just like the main, um, uh, as, as a, a formula, I call it like a magic formula was presented also in Brazil, similar to other, other countries, kind of international model that travels a lot. What I tried to understand is what happened when it was applied in a country such as Brazil with all this, all, with this urbanization marked by, this, by a very unequal society, lots of segregation and so on. So that's when I started uh, working on that, there was kind of, um, it was in the beginning of the 19s. So it kind of was kind of a consensus that that was the only way to deal with cities nowadays. There was kind of what we now know that it was a hegemonic uh, planning, uh, planning method or planning 
uh, ideas that were going all over the, the board, uh, mainly with influence uh, from, uh, from Barcelona, for instance, the idea of the strategic planning, the idea that you had to do uh, partnerships that uh, the state couldn't afford uh, to, to finance this kind of changes that the cities needed. And, but when I started doing research on it, that's why I say that it's very important to, to learn about our own uh, traditional thinking and also doing a lot of empirical research. There are some pictures that I took and uh, it was kind of by accident that I went there because it was very hard to find uh, information, uh, formal information in the, in the city hall. And there I had to go there and start asking people what was going on. And what I found out was this very different picture from, the, from what was being told uh, for, uh, for us, even in the university. So this kind of partnership was not, uh, was not exactly what they, they meant, but it, uh, in the end, uh, what happens that forced uh, those people from the, it, it promised to, to solve the housing problem of the people living in the most rich areas of the city by setting property rights and even transforming those property rights in kind of bounds. And that leads us to the discussion on financialization and so on, because there, they were action at the, in public actions by the city hall and people, uh, and not yet, please. Uh, people, the, the former slide, people had to, to uh, so the situation was that even the population living in, not this slide, but the previous one, living in the richest area of the city that had the right to housing and the Brazilian constitution and the democratization process in 1988 that was included the, the right to the city and later on the right to housing, but instead of fighting explicitly to the right to housing, which is, was a very important fight in Brazil, by, and it is right now also, we have very strong uh, housing movements, but inserted in this kind of mechanism of public-private partnership, what seemed right to, to some dwellers of the slums was to, to defend the model because if they didn't uh, defend it, if they didn't say that uh, the city hall should uh, sell property rights and attract investors and attract the private partners, there would be no money to change this area. So the discourse was that um, the city hall wouldn't have to spend money on that because everything would be paid by the investors and in the end, by the research, what I found out that it was mostly paid by, by what we call public funds, which include the budget and, and many other forms of public funds. In some cases, for instance, public lands. And so I wouldn't, I won't go more in the detail because we don't have much time, but uh, this kind of discussion I've been doing on PPP based on this international literature, on the Brazilian uh, urban studies and theory, and also a lot on, uh, on research, uh, on empirical research, because otherwise I think it's easy to, to be convinced by the discourses. Um, so, in, in, the last, so most of people, as I was saying, and thank you for the picture, most of the, picture, the, the people were not uh, um, included in the few social housing buildings that were built in the rich area and were evicted and had to live uh, in, um, in other slums, in, uh, in this case, in a water protected uh, environmental uh, area of the city. Uh, it, because it was the only place they could afford with the, the money they got uh, when they were evicted. And so that gave rise to environmental issues and so on. And I tried to show that uh, there's a very concrete way of saying uh, what was mentioned before with the theoretical concept, the connections between legal and illegal. It's not just like two different uh, uh, processes, but they are totally interconnected. And I think we can uh, discuss that in a theoretical way, why they are interconnected in a reality such hours. And we can also prove them when we do the empirical research. Uh, it was not my aim to prove that, 
But what happened is that I started to follow what happened with people that were being evicted and then they moved straight to this area. So the last thing I was going to say is about financialization, a few words, finance globalization, finance-led globalization, financial globalization, different terms for, to discuss this global phenomena that, uh, show, that happens in different ways in each country, such as the subprime in the US, the developer tsunami in, uh, in Spain, uh, many changes that, that I'm trying to understand in Sweden. Even in Cuba, there is a student uh, supervised that's studying uh, the real estate activities nowadays, very different, but each of them are very different. And what I've, I, I will try to say is a few words just to finish about how it's been going on here in, in Brazil. Uh, so the general idea is that urban land and property and therefore cities seem to be under pressure to be treated as a pure financial asset and reduced to an open field for the circulation of interest bearing capital since the creation of land markets, as David Harvey argues. So there is a speculative character of the, of the land market that is intrinsic to capitalism. And, and it is as if we have a new layer now with financialization of speculation going on. But how that happens here in Brazil, we didn't have the same kind of uh, securitization process that happened uh, there in the US, but we did have some changes. And again, we ha I had to resort to a lot of uh, empirical research in order to map uh, the channels through which uh, international finance capital got into the country, but also to map the permanence, what hasn't changed. And we still have like lots of companies that are part of it uh, belongs to the international finance capital, but part of it still belongs to the national elites. Uh, please, the next slide. So what I try to discuss is that, is that uh, we had this kind of global logic of finance capital, which has been much discussed uh, lately, but we have also obstacles that finance capital encounters in, a, in, a, in Brazilian cities. And uh, so only with this kind of, um, of uh, empirical research, I think we can, uh, we can map uh, how it tries to overcome or circumvent those barriers. It's the next one. So I, of course, I won't be able to tell you the results of the research, but that just gave a feeling of what I've been trying to map. So we have like a global international company like Equity International led by Zanzel and then investing in different countries such as China and Mexico. And, and one, the way that got, they got into Brazil was buying this uh, Brazilian, um, it's not buying, it's taking control, finance control of a Brazilian company. Uh, taking it to the stock marketing, open up its, uh, making it a public uh, tradable company and then selling it uh, again. So it's kind of just short term speculative movement, but with, uh, with lots of consequences for the landscapes. When we talk like that, it seems that now finance capital is changing the cities. Everything has to do with about finance capital, but when you do more research on it, then you finally realize, and I'll show it in the, in the next few images. The next, um, yeah, that's inter equity international buying part of the fees. This is just one example. I have several of them in other, that I can tell you another opportunity if you want, but uh, not now, just the next, please. So uh, what has to do, what I'm, what I'm bring, why am I bringing you here, this imagery of a housing program? It seemed like it is public uh, housing program. It's a social policy, uh, very good in, in a way, because we, have, we had in the beginning of the 2000s, we have 2009, sorry, in the end of the 2000s, we had this housing program prom uh, promising to build uh, like millions of housing. And how are, is that connected with, with uh, what I'm telling you? 
And what we can realize is that nothing is going on about in this realm of financialization and finance capital going in the cities without lots of public money, without the state and with, without the state making its disconnection between the global finance capital and the cities. And, and so that, that makes the program, as you can guess, very controversial because it's important that there are a lot of houses being built, but it also means that these housing are being built uh, in a way that it benefits a lot of financial investors and the Brazilian owners of this kind of home builders. And they, are built, they, they, they were built in the peripheries of the city with low quality architects and planner had, uh, uh, couldn't uh, do much about it. And also, uh, it's not a surprise for us, but perhaps it's very strange for you to learn that the housing debt, the housing shortage uh, was too huge after all these houses were being built because there was so much speculation that uh, people who could afford to rent a house before that couldn't anymore. So you had new, more people again without being able to pay for the houses so that we understand that, uh, that what we should know since the beginning, that the problem of housing is not solved uh, with this kind of productivist uh, uh, way and with protagonism of the home builders, at least not in a country like uh, Brazil. So in order to finish the last uh, thing, I think I have just two minutes to finish. So. Uh, some findings, last uh, findings, is that uh, I've been trying to map the channels of entry into the country of international finance capital, but also the permanence of power and national permanence, property, the relevance of public funds, such as subsidies and budget expenditure, the collisions and conflicts between different cap pressions of capitals, and try also to understand the connections between the formal real estate production, housing policies, state subsidy project, and self-construction of the so-called informal settlements, which still happen here. And the next, please. So in order to, that's the main uh, discussion I was trying to make. This is just an epilogue I couldn't, um, I, I, I thought that I, I must mention that uh, nowadays uh, we, we are in a different situation from that. Perhaps some of you know that uh, now we have here an explosive and a very perverse uh, combination between neoliberalism and authoritarianism. Uh, that's not only in Brazil. You had that in the US recently with Trump. We still have a he Bolsonaro here. Uh, and that is already resulting in changes and challenges for the cities. That was uh, published a few days ago, uh, um, uh, research that shows that the numbers of favelas do doubled in Brazil in the last uh, 10 years. So it's in this context, I think it's still very important to advance in the critical, reflexive, theoretical effort associated with transforming uh, struggles and world articulations such as the one that you are building here for just cities, I think are very much, uh, very important. So thank you so much. And uh, I'm available, available if you want to talk or discuss and also I'd like very much to hear about that. I'm sorry if I went too fast. I was worried about time. I know that you were very strict on time. And I yeah. didn't want to, <laughs> yes, I'm very strict. <laughs> <to make you. laughs> Thank you so much. Before, before I, uh, we go into the, uh, the real discussion, I just want to highlight the fact that we had very different people talking about very different ideas. And I'm very curious to know how these ideas land in different places, right? Uh, we had Faranak talking about um, uh, colonization of, of our imaginations, and that led to a discussion on colonialism. Uh, we had Mona talk, talking about informality, and that led to a discussion on the role of the state. And now we had Mariana talking about fin financialization. And also, uh, one thing I, I want to highlight, you also talked about the grassroots movements in Brazil and how it is very, very active, right? And I I'm very curious to know where this is going to lead. 
Caroline, Carolina, uh, anyone, do you have any questions or comments? There is a question in the in the chat, uh, Roberto, that I think is quite interesting by uh, Luis Felipe. Maybe yes. you want Luis, to... Luis, do you want to say your, your question? Okay, uh, hello. Uh, how grassroots and popular housing movements originated in, uh, after the 80s in the context of uh, redemocratization of you know, the country that is talked about in the papers? Uh, how then those, all of those housing uh, organizations could uh, tackle those questions within and together with the government, taking um, housing plans developed by planners uh, closer to those local communities needs, you know, taking into account failures that have been uh, in this way from Benyaga in Minha Casa Minha Vida. Luis, Luis, your question had several uh, sub-questions. Huh? Just for us to understand, can you repeat the main question? Just very quickly, just. Uh, okay, how- Without those... all the explanations. <laughs> how those uh, grassroots movements could mm -hmm. come together uh, in uh, talking with the government to make housing plans closer to the local communities instead of taking them to the peripheries and, you know. All right. Thank you. Mariana. Thank you, Louise, and also thank Hoko for the, your comment. Yes, I, I managed to watch the previous lectures and, and then I, I changed a bit, a bit of what I was, I was planning in the beginning in order to, to bring uh, some more possibilities of dialogue. So uh, I think uh, the, the idea of um, making the capacity of imagination alive, if I got it right, what Faranak was saying, is very important so that I was trying to, that, to stress this during my, my talk. And I was also dealing somehow with the informalization, informalization debate, informal or formal debate that Mona was saying that's part of, uh, of those concepts that we discuss in the text. But as for the Luis Filippi question, uh, I see that you know the Brazilian uh, reality. I don't know if you are Brazilian, but I see that because you know the names of the housing programs. And, uh, but if I could uh, give a short answer to that, is that um, you know that we have, um, the, the, we had this, the, the, the housing, the pro-housing, social movements tried a lot, I think, I think during the, when we had uh, from uh, 2002 until 2014, we had in the national government, the Labour Party, uh, they tried to put uh, the agenda of, of what we call here, the urban reform. I, I know it doesn't make sense in many languages, including English, it can be uh, understood differently, but by urban reform, we mean here a very progressive, or what we thought it was a very progressive movement of changes in the city in a democratic way, making it more uh, land and housing available for everyone and less uh, inequalities and so on. And uh, Luis Felipe is from our school. <laughs> so, uh, yes. So, what, uh, what happened is that. Uh, what we had when we had the Labour Party in power, we had the kind of, uh, some people called it a kind of concili class conciliation government in which they tried uh, to give some kind of response to the pro-housing social movement, but also to please the real estate and agribusiness and banks <laughs> sectors. The three sectors, not by coincidence, that were not internationalized in the 60s and in the 50s and 60s, because uh, 60s. And that's why it's so important always to understand that it, it's a kind of dependent economy, a former, co a former colony that's you in, uh, in a position of uh, in a subordinate position in the international division of labor. 
And uh, so while other sectors of the economy got internationalized, uh, such so as the most famous one, the automobile industry, for instance, we had a national elite in a very nickel country, which kept for itself as a kind of reserved uh, orbit, this kind of sectors, banks, agribusiness, and what interests us most in this discussion, real estate. So real estate being speculative and being profitable for, for them, it's like something very important. Of course, it's important in the US, it's important everywhere, everywhere. but here it's kind of uh, in the political economy of, of, uh, of the Brazilian uh, society, it's very important because uh, they, they couldn't uh, invest this money in other sectors such as industry, or at least uh, not as much as they would like. And then in order to make this kind of business uh, see, with similar profit, profitability as others, so speculation and uh, land rent and all this is very important. And that's why there's all this pressure put on, on this. And I think that what make the game very unequal and even when we had the Labour Party in power, the social movement that had experimented in very important, uh, interesting, relevant experiences, such as I tried to show you a little bit, like the multi ruins, the participatory budget in local governments, they couldn't do the same in the national government. And that uh, the result was this kind of uh, Minha Casa Minha Vida, My Home, My Life program. And now, you, as you know, we are even in a worse condition because I think there is no possibility of dialogue uh, from, uh, from well, any maybe kind of we social can, movement uh, maybe, and, uh, and Bolsonaro government. Yeah, maybe we can connect to the next question, which is about, um, I think uh, Stephanie is uh, asking, uh, what is the conditions of um, urban development in, uh, after Bolsonaro? She sees ahead uh, after Bolsonaro. That makes us very happy that we can think about how uh, after Bolsonaro we're still worried about election next year because uh, they have a similar machine of lies that was raised by Trump and uh, it's very powerful here. They have they are being they are producing their own uh, version of every fact and it's we are already in dangerous in a very dangerous condition. But uh, th that doesn't mean that uh, we don't uh, have to keep uh, um, thinking about how to, to do in a, in a, in a post-Bolsonaro Brazil. And that means to reflect on all this experience we had in the last few years in order not to repeat the same kind of policies, in order to to reconnect uh, with this kind of more radical thinking about cities. And uh, we do have a lot of different uh, ways of thinking how we manage uh, to, to change the cities. And, uh, and some of them, I think- uh, I have a question. Do you think, do you think that uh, Bolsonaro is steering the social mo movements in Brazil? Are they becoming more active because they are resisting or not? more active yeah yeah until now i'd say that uh, he was detached from social movements but there are some recent uh, events in which there uh, it, that, but that was like last week events so we still trying to map what's going on they, the main uh, producer of material videos and material far uh, of um, extreme uh, right wing uh, for for Bolsonaro government uh, made an, an alliance with a group uh, from uh, Islam dwellers. So they are trying, I think, to connect uh, with social movements and make them part of their. Uh... Oh no! But my question is the contrary: Are social movements resisting Bolsonaro? Resistance Bolsonaro. Yeah, are they fighting against Bolsonaro or not? Yeah, we do have lots of demonstrations here, but uh, I don't think that any of them uh, have the power now to take him out of uh, out of the government. 
since we, we have elections next year and the vice president is military, which put, put uh, this pressure on, uh, on uh, even if we have an impeachment process, you would still have the same group in power. So I think most of social movements are more uh, concerned with elections next year than... Uh, then, but we do have municipal governments yet. And you know, like, as a federation, there are experiences of uh, democratic government going on in cities, for instance, such as Belém. And so it's, it's, a, it's a different situation. You couldn't okay. expect, uh, any social movement couldn't expect much from a, from a national, if you if you see what's going on with uh, my my house my life the national program now they are making it more available for the for the beach again and uh, so it's are there more questions and comments caroline carolina hugo from the audience or from the audience I, there's uh, dion who um was was a question in the chat. Dion, do you want to uh, tell us your question? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just wondering, have Brazil seen any proactive housing reforms or policies since the pandemic hit, particularly with those living in favelas? Yeah, that's a good question, but it's very hard situation. I, you know that the government has delayed. Uh, we have a very uh, good, uh, perhaps we wouldn't expect that, but people who know Brazil know, knows that uh, Hoku knows very well because he 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 knows the the SUS, the how how would call the SUS, Hoku, the National the, Health uh, System, the, the Brazilian National Health N System, NHS. It's, uh, it's an amazing system. It was built uh, after a long uh, struggle of, uh, of many people. And we could have people vaccinated very fast here. And uh, the, the government did whatever they could to delay that. So the struggle was to survive. It is still to survive this government. So it's very hard to, to have pro proactive uh, housing policies in, in the beginning since the pandemic. The efforts, efforts were more on uh, how to, in a, in a situation that uh, is very difficult to, to follow the, the, the isolation, uh, house of shelter, house, how to say that in English, the sh shelter at home policies, uh, because it's dense and uh, and people have to work, so there was struggle to get funds in order to have um, a, a grant that would uh, avoid people having to go out to work and face risks. And uh, that, that that was something successful. At, at least was a small grant. Of course, the government uh, uses that also and as an opportunity to advertise that's helping people, but uh, that helped. That happened also only after there was struggle and the government didn't want to do that in the beginning. So for, it's only now that we have uh, most of, uh, of the people vaccinated and able to, to get together more. Like we had some demonstrations in the past two months and for this, the first time it, it, it seemed a little bit less dangerous to go on the streets and protests and get together and so just you know. ju just making sure people understand i don't think the uh, current brazilian government which is relatively recent right in the last three years is interested in providing uh, housing <laughs> to people so i think that's a uh, any, yeah, any no, not interested at all because it, it's kind of this combination of saying that you have the the, the minister for economics uh, is very well, uh, it's known for the neoliberal uh, pro policies and discourse, and at the same time you have a very conservative uh, by uh, government authoritarian repressing people. So it's it was more like um, 
for many people, we had like a coup, a coup d'etat a few years ago in 2016. And, and since then, uh, its situation is, is much worse than uh, in the times I was describing. I, I had prepared a, a timeline. I didn't show it to you because that would lead us to kind of historic overview that would take more time. But if you, if you get interested, I can send it to you when you have this times, this, this timeline in the 60s where the, the urban studies started to grow, the military coup d'etat in 1964, and then we had the democratization process in the beginning of the 80s. And that's when we started to have in just very progressive, progressist uh, policies, at least in the, in the municipal government. And uh, we, we had uh, just the, the insertion of Brazil in the finance-led uh, globalization in the beginning of the 90s. So it was this combination of having a new constitution, having democracy, having very interesting uh, social spirits and struggle. But at the same time, already in a world that when neoliberalization was going on, so we had this combination of neoliberalization and democracy for a while, with uh, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, then we had Lula's government, which is the left-wing, uh, so-called left-wing uh, Labour Party from 2002, 2014. And then we had the crisis, the economic crisis with uh, Dilma, when Dilma was the president, and she faced an impeachment process, which was uh, for, uh, for us uh, considered like another uh, kind of parliamentary coup d'etat. And then uh, in 2016, and then we had the election of this, perhaps Pedro, uh, perhaps Rocco has kind of words to describe him. For me, it's difficult. Uh, Bolsonaro, I don't know how you could uh, resume uh, Bolsonaro in a few words, but that's the situation right uh, now. Fascist? Fascist. Uh, <laughs> uh, questions are popping in um, uh, from uh, Luis Felipe and Stefania, which, uh, we need to, Sagar, uh, we need to, to wrap up this part. Uh, if I may, I will read the questions from Stefania and Luis and Sagar. The current government also diminished the Ministry of Cities, which is a ministry specifically for cities. I assume that it's also a huge setback in Brazilian urbanism. Do you believe there are any permanent or long-term negative effects? If yes, what would you? Uh, what would be a, a way of trying to reverse that? So I wait a minute, Mariana, before you ask, answer very quickly. In your opinion, is there a light at the end of the tunnel for housing matters or urban qualification? Just curious because I have read both articles and it focus and they focus more on the present and past reality. Sagar is saying nothing's going to happen until federal or state government put policy and law of right to affordable housing. Capitalism cannot work with socialism. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I understand the, the, what you mean. Nothing's gonna happen until the federal or state government put policy and law uh, to affirm the right of, of, of affordable housing, I think. Capitalism cannot work uh, with socialism. Can you, can you try to answer very quickly, Mariana? I'm not sure if I got the last uh, sentence. Right, capitalism cannot work with socialism. Yeah, maybe Sagar, you can explain what you mean. I'm not hearing. Oh uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, what did I mean was that you know, like capitalism is more like a profit orient, orient uh, system, corporate control system. And you know, socialism would be like more like a basic rights for everybody, you know. So if we are in the capitalist society, I think that sense of thinking kind of hides away, you know, giving affordable or basic income to everybody. Uh, that's what I was trying to say. You know, those two cannot work together for benefits. Wow. <laughs> Mariana, do you want to answer? Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if I got it totally right, but if, if uh, well, I would say that in a, if the, it, it was not for the fight for a struggle for socialism, capitalism would be different, isn't it? For instance, we would still have 
long, in, long hours of work, even longer than we have, perhaps 14 hours a day, women's, women wouldn't uh, be able to vote and, uh, and housing would be, wouldn't be uh, decent even in, in Europe and so on. So I'm not, I'm not sure if I got it right, but I would say that the result we have now, right now, it's not like pure capitalism. That's something that just doesn't exist but it's have a result of some kind of system of accumulation, which sure it's profit oriented and so on. And it's very difficult to oppose to it. It's very strong. And, so, but we do have, uh, that's why I would not, I, I wouldn't like to discuss financialization, for instance, with, without mention that uh, even what have the changes that haven't happened in capital accumulation in the finances uh, sphere, they're above like very abstract process of accumulation has to do with this struggle here and on the on the helm of, of class struggle. So I would say that uh, it's um, it's there all the time. It was there since the beginning. Since the beginning, we had reactions, we had resistance, and that was very important for us to don't live in even in a more unjust and predatory system that we do live right now. I, but I'm, I'm, I, I think on this note, because you, you explained very, very well right now, I just want to point out that a lot of capitalist countries, um, not a lot, but many capitalist countries also have um, affordable housing, uh, free health care, um, and other things that people uh, tend to think are socialist, right? But they are also part of capitalist countries. I live in a country like that where uh, well, healthcare and housing uh, is made affordable, although it's not public. And also, right. if I can just say something yeah. to end it, uh, this idea is that uh, uh, even uh, because then I totally agree with you, but if, if we are talking about uh, the importance of this kind of fights to the social reproduction, the production of uh, workers, but even for the capital itself, what is so sometimes com confused with socialism, for instance, the using of public funds is very important. There is no accumulation happening without the state. And this is not just a general statement, but I try to show that uh, during all the, what was saying, that even uh, for uh, real estate uh, to be profitable in, a, in an equal country such as Brazil, it, it, it can't depend only in its own resources. So it uh, tries all the time to, to have like public funds, subsidies, state land, state policies and so on. So the thing is not just about saying, should we have state or not? Should we have kind of social struggles or not? But it's to recognize that there is a struggle going on. There is a dispute for public funds about going on. There are funds even in a country like such as Brazil, it's an unequal country, but has a lot of wealth being produced all the time. So the thing is where to put that money on. And then that's something that planners has to do and has to deal with, and we have to deal with that. And I think there is a lot to do, at least to, to show, if not, when we cannot interfere so much, as much as we can, at least to show where the money is being put and, and, uh, and try to show uh, that it could be different. So just to end. Good, thank you so much. Guys, and I see Bagheri, uh, thanks a lot for your question. Uh, we don't have time, we will have to move on. Uh, Mariana, on behalf of the TU Delft and all the other partner universities, thank you so very much for your contribution today. Uh, you are welcome to hang around, I know that you want to. Uh, we are going to have a two minute break, which the British call um, a comfort break. And we will uh, come back in three minutes. So, well, uh, uh, a quarter past uh, eight, and we will have a, a quiz and a kind of um, interactive uh, survey, okay? So we can discuss even more. I will see you in four minutes then. See you guys. See you. <laughs>